to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers. XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit sennheiser.com slash xswd.
Hello everyone, welcome back to Pro EV Live. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. We've got a rather exciting one, actually. I'm quite looking forward to this chat. Um, we've got, of course, none other than Philip Bloom joining us. Thank you very much for joining us, Phil. How are you? Fine, fine. You? Excellent. Yep, I am very, very, very good. Um, we have got all sorts of exciting things going on at the moment. The channel's actually been really quiet in the last couple of weeks, so apologies for everyone watching it who um, has been missing any normal content that's been normally going out on the channel. It's been quiet because we're preparing for um, some really exciting things, including next week, which is a huge week of Canon promotions, um, which I just wanted to make people aware of before we crack on with the conversation because there's going to be tons of content that's Canon themed. There's going to be tons of promotions that are Canon themed, all sorts of stuff going out next week. So keep an eye out for that. So that's why we've been a little bit quiet. But we booked this, Phil, to talk about the essential equipment to recommend for people um, starting out. And we're obviously going to talk about some specific equipment here, but I, I think the, the, the general idea here is to be quite big picture, isn't it? Sort of what? Yeah. What's important? Like, is, is it, are cats that important? Do, do all filmmakers need a cat? Every, I don't know. Any, all the good filmmakers I know have cats. And this is Lollipop. And do you know what? Gerald Undone has just got himself a rescue cat. Has and he? And do you know what Excellent. the rescue cat is called? Phil? Lollipop. Oh, Lollipop. Lollipop. What the so he, was already called lollipop? Already called lollipop, but wow, so there's two of us with lollipops, but she's the original <laughs> lollipop. So that's the first priority is to get a cat because when you're ed if you're unless you don't edit, but if when you're editing, you need company, and also need subjects to film. So that yeah, is very that, useful. Yeah. When I had to do camera reviews at home during lockdown rather than here in the office, it's like, uh, what do I film? I know, Tula, come here, <laughs> come here, kitty. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the wife wasn't in the... Uh, no, she, no she, she's not interested. Cats are notoriously not that fond of being told what to do, but the wife is even less fond of it. <laughs> um, so we're going to cover... I, th I think we're going to stay away from cameras, probably, as, as a whole, a camera? as a topic. Who needs a camera? I'm using a webcam right now on my... No, you're on not. My, <laughs> on my iPhone. You haven't got I mean, shallow depth of field like that on a webcam. It, it's, it's fake. It's portrait mode. It's fine. No, it's not. He's lying to you people. <laughs> um... Yeah, because I think that, uh, I think people talk about cameras a lot when they're starting out, and that's very understandable. You know, I'm more than happy, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this job to be talking to people about cameras all day long. But I think it's often the more basic essentials, you know, the tripod, the lights, the audio, that is so crucially important when starting out, which people often not neglect they always end up buying them but they just think of them as a second sort of you know oh and while i'm here i need a tripod just slap anything on you know what's the cheap one that sort of thing what's the what's one with three legs give me one of those <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah one of the three-legged tripods please yeah none of those those two-legged ones that uh, i i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little bit further around get a bit more money and get one of those three-legged tripods <laughs> yeah <laughs> treat yourself <laughs> i can't i afford one leg at a time so I've got two monopods and i get the third one later three monopods <laughs> and then just gaffer tape around the top bungee i think it's fine yeah we are actually going to do some good serious advice by the way if for anyone watching that's worried <laughs> immediately um i'm yeah. seeing some great questions come in and some good chat happening as well um so leave whatever question we can see the youtube chat and we can see the facebook questions and comments um here as we go through so um let us know what your cat's called there's a couple of that happening and um let us know what equipment you want us to talk to or what you think what we think of equipment if you're if you've got anything that you're considering but you want us to get phil's thoughts on then let us know that as well but where do you want to start phil it's getting my uh, keyboard Nice slow auto focus on this. Yeah, your iPhone. your iPhones. <laughs> focus. Okay, where should we start? Should we start with the good old fashioned tripod, which is not three yeah. monopods struck together? It's an actual tripod. Yeah. So um, I've been doing this fifty years now, more or less. Um, officially, I, well, think, I know oh, it was 30... your fiftieth birthday yesterday. So Phil, yeah, it feels <laughs> like I've been doing it since. Since I feel like I came out. 
popped out of my mum's <laughs> room with a camera and a tripod because I needed it because I couldn't stand up straight away. So I needed a tripod. Yeah, but your handheld was awful my... at that age. Yeah, so I have been shooting professionally since 1989. So whatever that is, do the mathematics. It's coming up to 32 years 32 this year. Years, yeah. So, um, and that was a Vinton Vision 10 yep. tripod, um, which you can't buy those specifically now, but they are, I mean, God, I, mean, it's, I still have one of these upstairs in the, in the storage. And it's great. It's just not really for what I need right now. But the, the, you just get them serviced every now and then, and they will just keep on going. That ca uh, I think the, ca the tripod that I've used the mo since when I went freelance in 2006, I bought a, the first tripod I bought that was good was the Miller DS20 Solo. And I probably used that across maybe 10 cameras. Mm -hmm. So that just shows you just like the cameras come and go, but the tripods, you know, it's a bit like the cats will be the constant and the girlfriends will come and go, if you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like the constants will be there and the, tri the tripod is the constant because as long as the tripod can is the right payload for your camera, then it works. It's not necessarily always going to be the right one. I do have a lot of tripods, but I basically use two two main video tripods and then i use stills tripods for other things and my those two main tripods that i use i can use for my lightest cameras well i'm not going to put a gopro on it but my lightest proper cameras like a mirrorless all the way through to my heavier rigs which would be currently maybe the komodo or my fx6 really built up but it worked great with the fx9 when i had that mm -hmm. so but the fact is and um, that's what kind of that's great and but there's times when i don't always want to go out with the heaviest tripod and there's times when i don't want to travel with the heavier tripod so i have a lighter one so my main tripod the most expensive one i have is the sackler flotec 75 millimeter bowl one with the oh what's the head from sackler called it's, it's just the there. fsb line it would F be yeah it's probably the fsb, the FSB if you haven't upgraded F to the actives and let me put my glasses on. It's the FS something, FSB, or yeah, F or FSB, uh, FS8. Yes, there's the FS8, 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 FS4 and FS8. Which, which was better. It was more expensive, but the reason I got this one was because it had a lower base payload, and so the cheaper ones have a payload which will be shifted towards the higher end on on this line, mm -hmm. and if you go a bit more money, then you can get one which has a wider payload. Yep. Um, which is what I wanted. So that's the tripod that I will use with all of my heavy cameras because the joy of that is you can raise and lower it from the base position. So you're not bending down. And when you've got a heavy camera, the last thing you want to be doing is to be picking up your tripod. I mean, if you don't know how to set up a tripod with more than one stage, basic advice, unless you know you're going to be shooting low, always drop the first stage first because if you do this you know if you go from the second stage first then when you want to go a bit high you're actually going to get bend right down to the ground to raise it from that so basic tips of tripods but the great thing about this is everything's adjusted from one position so which is just to right. clarify with the photos that i've got here on stage phil first was talking about a tripod like this with several stages in the legs so just the bottom one first and then all the other stages come up with you Whereas he's then talking about the Flowtech here with these red catches on the top. You see the red ones right up the top near the tripod head. And those are the, the lashes blue if it's that Vinton. stay. Yeah. Blue if it's Vinton, true. The satchel ones Vinton are red, version. the Vinton ones are blue. Yeah. But apart from that, yeah. the same tripod. And they're great. They're very solid, very rigid. They're not the cheapest tripod, but they are an investment. The, this, these will see you yes. through many, many, many cameras. Well, this is um, the, you, uh, the cheapest head bundle that Satchel do with the Flowtech legs. Yeah. And even that, you know, including that is 1,320, which is... Is that the, um, the XL? Yeah, yeah like the XL. XL head has a, I think it has a higher minimum payload. Well, it's got two FSG to eight, eight kilos, um, which is not What's too FSG? bad, actually. That's pretty um, good, yeah. The FSB4 might be the one you're thinking of, because that does have quite a high entry payload. Um, despite having quite a low max payload. What's the FSB8? Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if they still do the FSB eight um, with the. I think. But yeah, I mean, there's other heads you can get out there, like yeah, the taking it off the, it's been replaced by the actives. The Miller, the Miller twelve CX or whatever it's called CX twelve. Mm -hmm. um, is what was what's one of the, it's a really fantastic head it's, that's probably my favorite head that i own and what's great about it is the minimum payload is zero so i can yeah. literally put Which on quite rare. like an insta 360 go it might be and the, that's that's gone past it, I think it might be um, the that go, should be there as well but uh, it's 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 a fantastic fantastic head and what i like about both the sackler heads and the um, this Miller head is I can go to yes. zero friction as well So I can literally just spin it around. So if I want to be like Really loose and I can do it, but if I want to get really nice solid I want my try my microphone sorry, falling down. Sorry guys. Falling down. Yeah, sorry. Let me clip it on properly um, So yeah, I mean it's these are the key things you need to look for in a tripod is Obviously it's within your budget, but don't look too cheap a carbon fiber one will be lighter obviously um it needs to be a bold tripod so 75 or 100 most likely for using a lighter camera if you're not using big heavy cameras then 75 all my tripods i use these days are 75 i don't need a 100 mil bowl tripod so but look at what you're using if you are running around with um a Canon C700 or uh, you know who knows what uh, you bought yourself a, a Venice only Venice and you're looking at don't if you've got a Sony Venice don't buy the cheapest tripod you can <laughs> no. get spend some money on a tripod so that's good and the lower tripod that I use is the cheaper one is the E image you know which model it is I can't remember this one GH06F plus 761AT although so I the think head you may have got it nice. before it turned into the F. So does yours go to flat base mode or is it just a 75 no. millimeter bowl? Just 75 bowl. So you've got the normal GH06. We've since then, they've replaced it with the GH06F. So we've stopped selling that one. So it's now so the you F. So can you, can, you can take well, off it, the bowl it's bit. still a 75 millimeter bowl, but the very bottom of the bowl is flat and the, right. the, the screwing rod um, is in the handle rather than in the tripod head. So that if you want to screw yeah. it all the way, it's just got a normal screw thread in the bottom of the 75 millimeter bowl. So you can screw it onto a flat based tripod or a slider or it, whatever you is want. Is it still the same case with the sticks that the, if you want the latches, that's only on the alloy. Yes. Whereas, yep. yeah. And I don't know why so they do I, that, but the carbon ones yeah. come with the twist and the aluminium ones come with the latch. I prefer carbon as a rule, but on this occasion, I probably would prefer the alloy because the latch is so mm. much easier to, you know, so just a, if you just want to change the height, it's a latch we don't, as opposed to turning something. Mm. So you can much easier change your height. Latches are so much better. And also the great thing about a latch is, you know when it's closed. <laughs> yes. Whereas, when, when you're turning it, you've got to make sure you turn it all the way because there's so often you don't get all the way and you just see your trouble slowly going, mm -hmm. <laughs> something's loose, something's loose. I, I, what I would say, though, is I completely agree with you, but I do speak to a lot of customers that like it the other way around. So I think it is very much they a like, sort of like marmite thing. They like it loose. They like it twisty and loose. Um, twisty. <laughs> so I think it's absolutely a bit of a marmite situation, you know, depending on what you're used to. Some people really like. And the, the reason that they like the twisty one is they say is speed they say they can do it so much quicker go dun 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 extend and close much quicker than a latch personally i've never How? found that i can't do it quicker i could do it quicker with latches but i mean a latch is like um and then um whereas a twist is uh, 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 yep. tight 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 yeah there's nothing quicker than pushing up and down they, they they've got problems and yep. they need to look at it reassess their tripod life <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can just see Alexandria is saying can't find resellers for image in France. Are you the only one in Europe? Uh, I don't believe we're the only one in Europe. I'm sure there might be we're some in France. We're not in Europe. But, but we, well, there's also that. <laughs> we're in Europe. We're not in the EU. No, only, <laughs> we're still only in, in Europe. The only in the geographical <laughs> sense. Yes, everything else we uh, no longer. But we, we ship worldwide. So we, we, can, we yeah. can ship you a tripod. Don't worry about that. So yeah, I really, really like the image head. It's the, I've always been agree. looking for a, a travel tripod, not like a really, really, but one that still works like a proper tripod yep. 
And uh, so, you know, when I do go out and about filming and it's not too heavy a camera, I, I will take this. The only reason I don't take, I don't want to take it with a heavier camera. It's just purely because of those, the way that it raises. It's just a pain with my back. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, I, I'll be going away, hopefully, uh, depending on what they decide about countries, uh, to Skathos again next month, in the next month. And that's the tripod I always take with me to Skathos. It's the lightest um, proper tripod. Yeah. B Ford is saying, along with a tripod, would a camera slider be an essential as well? No, not in the slightest. Um, sliders are fantastic, but there's lots of things which I would always consider secondary. Um, if you, once you've bought your essentials, then absolute sliders are fantastic. There's lots of different things out there. I actually just bought the Edel Crone Wing. I'm not sure I like it. It's a bit different, but. Um, motorized ones are, are kind of the only real sliders I, I actually use. And I use those for talking heads, for second angles mostly. And the, the iFootage one, I don't know the models, the one that um, mm -hmm. is the only one I'm really using. But oh, I don't the use Nano. Sliders that the, much. the Nano, the one that is, yeah. is all built in with the twisty built into yeah. the head. Yeah. I, I like that. I used to use them a lot more. And I've got some really nice systems from Rhino. Mm -hmm. um, and I just find. I, actually, the only one I've been using, I'm lying, the only slider, not, they don't call it a slider, but it is, I've been using recently has been the Goodson Moser Slypod oh, yeah. because I've been, I've been using it with the probe lens and it's perfect, the probe lens. They're, the only thing is that if everyone is looking at getting one, there is a new pro model, which is well, obviously more expensive and long, goes further. It's heavy. And whereas the original one, you could put on a tripod, it would stand out your camera. And, but the new one, I'm always having issues. It's almost like a jib in a way. You've got, to, you've got to be really careful about the rear of it and the camera tipping over because it goes out so far now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a, it's almost ne now needs to have like two tripods or something. It's, it's, I'm tempted to say, and also because um, I like the ones where you can raise up. And so it's like a, a bit, but because it starts off, this high it, it, it's whereas the other one the cheap one starts off much lower it doesn't go up as high but whenever you're doing slider moves anyway this the movement you actually do is really small as generally it's also all about subtle reveals yep. you know it's going past something um you know anything that's big get a, a gimbal which you know we can talk about later once we've gone past other essentials. While we're talking about these sliders and gimbals and things, I think may maybe it's good to just pause for a little bit and step way back. Why, why do you think it is that we would consider a tripod to be the essential of that? You know, I, I'm just thinking back to some conversations I've had with customers. I've even had a customer once say to me, well, why do I need a tripod? My a gimbal can be locked off. Hmm. You know, why, why, well, why is a tripod so essential? I, th I mean, a gimbal, yes, a gimbal can be relatively locked off, but, um, you know, it's, you still got to hold it. Um, you can put it on the ground, then you've got low shots. What, what do you ever, like, need to actually just film properly? Uh, what about on longer lenses? On a tripod, you can switch lenses super quickly and do all your shots. A gimbal is, is for movement. A tripod is for um putting your camera on and using it as a way to properly compose your shots. You look at my my work and 95% of it is tripod. And even within those tripod shots, the shots are static. Yeah. My movement tends to be within the frame. I have a very classical way of shooting that I like, although I do handheld when I'm doing documentaries and actuality and that sort of thing. Gimbals, I don't use a huge amount, um, but you know, I, I still like them. Um, I think I kind of outgrew them a little bit um, in that when I first got them, I was like, amazing, best thing ever and was using it for everything. And then went slowly back towards, I'm like, actually, I'm better off handheld for this mm. or, you know, I'm better off for this sort of, sort of stuff. And everything became a little bit too overused in any tool, really, like a drone, any of these things, the sliders. Whereas a tripod is the most important piece of gear. Because Can't it will use a tripod. A tripod, you put your camera on it, and there you go. You can compose your shot, and it can be perfect. You want to put on a long lens, put on a long lens. It's the only thing you might need to change is just the, the counterbalance if you want to do any. Okay. And but it, other than that, I mean, it, it is. For, it's just, it's the the most 
essential piece of gear once you've got all your basic camera accessories as in um like lenses batteries and stuff um because you've got something to put it on without something to put it on are you really going to hand hold it the whole time are you really going to put on a gimbal the whole time i mean i know people do i know people who yeah. just shoot on a gimbal and i'm like i don't think oh. i've ever been yeah. on a shoot where i haven't had a tripod with me nah. I don't ever. <laughs> I don't think. I think. I don't think I've done one single piece of work no. where I haven't at least bought the tripod. There's probably been ones where I haven't actually used the tripod, and I've just done mm. it all handheld or something like that. You know, very rarely. But I think I've always had a tripod with me. I mean, there are cameras out there now with IBIS, which which are really good and can give you an almost tripod-like stability shot. And if you then mm -hmm. add a bit of warp stabilizer on in post, it can look like a tripod. Mm -hmm. But in which case, just just use a tripod and save yourself the grief um it doesn't have to be super heavy but a proper tripod with proper fluid movement so you can do lovely smooth moves mm -hmm. um that's what you're after it's it's the most important piece of gear after you I mean, there's no point buying a tripod if you're not going to get a camera i know that for a fact um so there is an order of things to buy but um you know i mean i love stills tripods as well but i use those for locked off shots and other sort of things and of course for photography um and there's some great ones out there but um yeah the key thing you need to look for on a tripod is that's uh, the payload make sure it's fluid head make sure it's got some decent um um points uh, you know it's not the actual amount of friction or the levels you can put on the the drag enough like some of them only have like two or three Maybe look for one with four or five. Um, make sure that you have one that will say the payload to go with with what you are going to use. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just the construction of it. I mean, it, the most the ones we've talked about are really well made and will see you through for many, many, many years. So, yeah. We Chris Eames has just put, don't forget the good old monopod. It's probably worth mentioning talking about monopods for a little bit. Yeah, so I don't like monopods, I have to say. They are a weird... They're, they're, they're good for certain things, for sure. Um, I think they're definitely great for photographers with long lenses who are doing, you know, bird watching and that sort of stuff, or sports guys. But And for video, I find oh, it's hard, you can't really... You can put a fluid head on it, but it's not going to be very good because you're still going to be wobbling a little bit, even no, with the, the, the little, legs at the bottom. Fluid head. And then if you want to, like, you can't go handheld quickly because you, uh, well... So you then got a monopod. What do you do you with got a monopod? monopod. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you could leave a tripod behind. On the floor. You, could, you could put it on the floor. It's fine. But I just find that I, when I shot my FX3 review, I went out with a monopod for the first time in ages. And I thought, I'm just going to be really minimal and use the monopod. I had 70 to 200. And I was, um, and I found it really awkward. And you know what? I dropped my 70 to 200. Um, when I was using that because I was just struggling because normally I would I have my hands I have a hand for the camera and a hand for the lens but I always had a hand on the monopod and mm. I was like ah, oh, and I dropped it and it, it fell straight front down and it was completely uh, unrepairable and um, Sony couldn't repair it so I got it replaced thankfully but it's like um, it wouldn't have happened with the tripod I was just faffing and fluffing and I was like oh it was a shitty day it was not a very good day it was like the weather was terrible it was like it was i, I was hating the fact i didn't have an evf with it mm -hmm. i was trying mm -hmm. to shoot manual focus with the the anamorphics and i'm like i don't know if it's in focus i have mm -hmm. no idea because there's no evf on it and then i played it back i couldn't check it back so i was getting very frustrated anyway but that and was then the worst you break thing. So, your lens so. <laughs> and i'm not gonna so monopo so i end up just going handheld with the ibis and i'm like this is yeah. better anyway so. Yeah, I, and actually James has literally put that same thing. I agree about monopods, especially now with IBIS and stabilised lenses, might as well go hand handheld. Just to play devil's advocate, um, I do know lots of customers that only use monopods. And so it definitely is particularly people doing very fast paced, like events work with a very small package. So, mm. you know, they've always been so popular for people shooting weddings and live events and gigs, that sort of thing, um, mm. when they start happening again um as long, and if you as long as yeah as long as it suits your the style of shooting and yeah. you're not going to be constantly moving and changing positions 
then if you're going to be in a, a pretty much a constant position um, and more or less the same lens, you can probably get away with it pretty well. I think well. same lens um, is the key. You know, yeah. if you're shooting with a small camera like a mirrorless, like an A7 or a, or a Canon R5, that sort of thing, uh, or GH5, you know, that sort of product, um, and you're keeping one decent range zoom lens on it, monopods can be quite nice and quick um and if you if you are sitting at home thinking well monopods might be right for you the one that i constantly find myself recommending a lot is the i footage cobra 2 so mm. um these because these are just really they cost a little bit more than the manfrotto's and equivalents or ben rose or anything mm. like that i personally think they're really worth it i think it's, it is nice because it has a latch which is great yep. and it has the little feet which can pull off to make you a, the, the best mini tripod yes. on the table this mini tripod over here on the left are you you've got one of these i think of you phil yeah except my mini tripod is can't get it off i don't know why oh it's in, <laughs> stuck so oh, i might dear. need to wd-40 it so yeah just because it never gets but, used because you don't use monopods there we go well, i did use it i took it out <laughs> and i used it and that's probably why it doesn't want to come off that now because it's it's cursed <laughs> right let's move along and talk about audio shall we audio. i mean yes. video is only half the picture right well it's the whole picture the audio is the whole sound <laughs> <laughs> if you can see the Very audio literal. then stop it <laughs> and stop it right now i mean you oh, probably dear. see i've recently have been <laughs> if you, you can see your audio you need to lie down <laughs> yeah I, I you can see my microphone a little bit and i might i have stopped when i'm filming myself for youtube I, on camera i don't hide my microphones anymore no, purely I. because i can't monitor it and i can't tell if it's rustling for anybody i'm filming i will hide the microphone because i don't want to see it my, my, I've like, been asked that a lot by customers is why, why do you always have your lab showing or happy with one of these dangling in shot or anything like that? And is that my, what you're using for the audio? I didn't this, see it. This is. Is that, yeah. mi is that a microphone? Oh. It's a microphone. It, it, can you didn't not see it? it? Is it not in frame enough? Oh, I can see it now. It was just, it wasn't, that in, yeah, it wasn't in, yeah. it wasn't in focus. I couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, the, I, I mainly, I, I say to customers, what's the purpose of it? If you're if you're okay with it feeling like a video production, then have the microphone in shot. It's fine. If if you if you're wanting the the fact that it's being a constructed thing to disappear, then the last thing you want is a microphone in shot because it will yeah. be an instant reminder to somebody that they're watching something that is a constructed video production. Yeah, if, if you're doing reviews and stuff, it's absolutely fine. Although I did, there is one guy who's. I had to tell him because I liked his videos, but like you've got this you know, mic, mic a bit like yours and he had it in front of his bloody mouth. So mm. you could never see his mouth moving. So either he wasn't actually talking and somebody else was doing all the talking, but I know it was, <laughs> it was just, just like, them all. <laughs> yeah, I was like, please, can I just want to see your mouth move. You need to see the mouth move if you're going to see somebody's face because it looks really weird if you don't. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't use big mics like that in frame, but I always have a lav mic in shot now. Um, I wouldn't really have anything else, but yeah, anything that I'm actually filming properly, there's, there's no chance I would ever want to see a, um, a, a microphone. Um, and handheld mics like that, I've seen them in a couple of YouTube reviews. Now that's terrible. Um, I don't know why anybody would use um, a cardioid mic like, you know, stick mic. It makes no sense to me whatsoever because they're designed to be really close, which are going to sound great, but you want to pick up anybody else, you've literally got to get it right over to them. Well, and they're you for cannot report, that's what they're for. They're for reporting. Yeah. They're, for, uh, they're for walking up to people and going, please tell me what you think of this. Thing. But I've, I've, had, I've worked with a reporter. I think it was, they were quite early on. It was like this. So they were like... Um, so tell me, uh, what exactly is going on here? Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. They're doing it the wrong way round, oh, and they were like, wow. and it was like, you need to do it the other way. So and so and wait till they finish talking before you want to ask your question. So they were always doing that, yeah. and that's why I look. Just get like something like this instead, which is the Rode Wireless Go Two which is a double set so it's two transmitters stick this on your talent and two double talent and you've got one so this is the receiver um and then there's two transmitters and they're great i mean i personally would never use the built-in well this i would never do this um it looks worse when it's on because it's got the lights um 
I would plug it because it's got a plug in, you know, use their smart life plus into it. And it's great. I mean, they're not designed for long range at all. They're designed for being close to people. Um, but then because the they other cool use thing... 2.4 gigahertz wireless, yeah. you, you can't yeah. be sure that you're not going to run into interference. Uh, it's another yeah. thing I'd, I'd like to remind but... customers about. And the cool thing about these is they can go on your finger, which is nice. <laughs> and they also record audio yeah. on them. So there's a, I think it's like at the lower quality, it's 24 hours of audio. And the quality is absolutely fine. Um, I would always recommend going on the lower quality on this rather than the higher one. There's, you won't tell a difference in audio. And the reason why, the higher one is seven hours, which you may think, oh, it's loads. But the thing is, it's, there's no control of recording right now. There will be. They'll update it. But right now, it will start recording on the transmitter the moment it connects to a receiver. So it'll be recording constantly. So if you're doing a day shoot, you could easily fill up that seven hours. And then what happens is it, it's a bit like your um, dash cam, is it will loop around and erase over the oldest. So go in the cheaper, the, the cheaper, the less, the more compressed, Percy agrees. Percy says you should go on the more compressed one. What does um, Percy think of the road wireless guy? See, Percy actually is more of a body pack kind of guy. Come here. We've, we've had a question about that actually from Mike saying, what do you think about these recorders with 32-bit float for run and gun work? Is it a lifesaver for those situations where you don't know what is going to happen, i.e. getting a few lines from an excited child? <laughs> so or I love I love these and I also have the, um, the Bluetooth ones of the Zoom F2BT, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. All right. right. So that's they're both 32-bit recorders. Um, the, the, you'll know how good 32-bit float is as a, as a recording method when you look at the Zoom, because you look at it and go, it's just got a record button on it. That's it. Well, how do I tell or something or some other thing? Or maybe you not notice that the camera stopped recording, uh, which does happen when you run out of space and you're not looking at a monitor and you go, oh, when did it stop recording? Oh, but at least we've got the audio. I said, I'll cover it with B-roll, it's fine. These are fantastic. And the joy of 32-bit float is, even if you've accidentally sent it to the lowest point, you bring it up and it's no noise. And even if you've got it to the highest point, as long as your microphone isn't overloaded, it will not be overmodulated. So, you know, what's interesting is when you send it, if I send this to my camera, the camera won't record in 32-bit float, it records in 24-bit. And if the level's too loud, it will be too loud on there. It will be distorted on the camera and it'll be unusable. And I look at, and I bring up the waveform from this in the computer and it looks the same, but I then just bring it down and it's perfect. Mm. And it sounds great. So 32 bit float is the future. Um, there's only two body pack style ones that do it. The, there is other devices which do it as well. And it's going to be more and more common. The Rode Wireless Go-To isn't 32-bit float, but the difference between that is you, you should be monitoring the Wireless Go at least, and so you will know when it's too loud or too quiet. Um, so, you, so you made a, a passing comment a minute ago that the tentacle is more expensive, but I, I, I just wanted to point out here, the joy about audio kit for the people who are starting out is that you know in the camera world we can talk about things which are less expensive and more expensive and we might be talking about the difference between a two thousand pound camera and a ten thousand pound camera you know it's a huge yeah. price range difference audio kit is nearly always on not the affordable we're still talking about hundreds of pounds but it's much even the stuff that's a step up is much more reachable like this 32-bit float recorder from Tentacle that you're talking about by itself is 338 or well, 339 yeah. pounds in fact yeah you know that people can it, stretch that normally it's amazing and, and the cool thing is is and it's the same with if you're going to get the zoom one make sure you get the bluetooth one the key thing is with a body pack is whilst you cannot monitor remotely um you can stop and start recording as opposed to with normally with the body packs, I had the, the Tascam DR100s and mm -hmm. basically you just record the whole time because you cannot remote trigger it and you have to sort it out later. Whereas I can just pull up on my phone, the app, I can see it's, it's coming through. I, you know, that, that you just simply cannot hear. You can hear if you want to, there is ways around it. You can do things like um, using the Rode Wireless Go in an opposite way 
which is take the um, the transmitter, but don't but do it the other way around. So we're actually putting the headphone output of your Zoom or your tentacle into your transmitter, and then on your receiver, you plug your headphones into the receiver, not the camera, your headphones. So you got wireless monitoring. And that's a system that I've been using. Uh, I said, if you don't, and if you want to be cheap, um, just for the system, you can absolutely just buy one of the much cheaper Wi-Fi uh, wireless systems, mm -hmm. just as as a way of having wireless headphones. Because you can't have, uh, if you want wireless headphones, nobody actually makes them for cameras yet. I mean, Bluetooth ones. They don't. Ex the, the reason that we don't have Bluetooth headphones in cameras is just a lag. Is, mm -hmm. is going to be, always be there unless well they get there eventually but wi-fi ones imperceptible and so i have i've i've got a few of the road wireless goes and i've got some of the cheaper ones and i have set up wireless headphones and they're great it, the freedom of not having i mean normally I mean, I've trashed so many headphones over my years of having, I normally just use buds on, you know, I curl it up, on, leave it on the camera. And then what will always happen is they'll, un they'll uncurl and they'll be dragging on the ground and I'll trip over it and rip it and I'll, damn it. Um, so the cool thing about a wireless one is just a short cable sticks onto the side of the camera, just to make sure it's charged up. And that's, and the wireless just sits over your neck. Uh, the headphones and it, and it is a such a freeing thing and if you're off you know filming yourself for example um you are able to monitor um not whilst you're recording because that's the, that's one step that people aren't doing thankfully on camera with their um their big mics in front they're not have the headphones on unless you're doing a podcast that's when people do it but it's like you know monitoring audio is so important we cannot under stress this and that's the downside of body packs is you don't monitor audio generally. So, I mean, looking at levels is not the same as monitoring audio because you cannot tell, especially with radio mics, you can't tell if there's interference, and, but you can't tell if there's any rustling of clothes. So it's all important to, 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 you know, to not be like really casual about your audio because you'll curse yourself if you're editing and you're like, why didn't I just check this? Or you know, I'm not, I've done some jobs where I've had people film me and I just wish that they said on location, can we, we need another take because there was some rustling and they didn't. I mean, and it's as you were explaining so that, there is a plane going over your head, which I can hear, which is the perfect example <laughs> of yeah. exactly the but sort of thing you can't tell. In an edit, you're not what I would have done is I would have just cut to a shot of the plane <laughs> so your brain would establish oh it's that as long as your brain is you're made aware of but the easiest way would have been hey carl great to do this live can i tell you something people those are really flying out of the country <laughs> yeah, these yeah. days now those planes sure are loud so once i've done that i've established the sound and this is a serious thing as long as you establish a sound, you know, normally not verbally, but see it in some establishing shots things. So if you've got a fountain or something in the... You or, see a, of see course, in your main piece to camera, you know, if you're doing an interview with someone and you're next to a busy road, have yeah. the busy road is part of your framing in the shot. And if you, and if you don't, let's see a wide with both your, norm, your framing that's going to be and the mm -hmm. busy road. Let's mm -hmm. establish mm -hmm. the sound. But you mm -hmm. need to establish a sound straight away. You cannot delay it because otherwise people mm -hmm. are going to go... Where's that? Where are those cars from? They're in a park. Mm -hmm. I can hear lorries and cars and planes, and I can only see a park. I mean, with what's re if you do check out my drone videos because you l listen to my piece of the cameras. Tell me if you can hear the drone. Mm. That's what I'd like to see, because um, there's you know, if you wear a lav mic really close to you, and uh, the drone's flying pretty slowly. But the great thing about a drone. I mean, it was, you, I could barely hear it until it got really close. But the drone is a consistent sound, mm -hmm. which you can take a noise print of and just remove it in noise reduction. Um, and that's, that's an absolute joy. You can't remove a, a car noises and stuff because it's not consistent sound. But a drone, consistent sound. But even when I wasn't doing it, I was like, wow, this sounds really good. Well, the drones just have a, you know, they're much, much quieter. And I always fly super, super slow. Yeah. The only thing I found was if I really, really need to make sure I do a sync clap because there's no scratch audio on my drone. And otherwise matching it up is just the worst, especially on a wide shot. 
But yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, so audio, I mean, top mics we didn't really talk about, but there's lots out there. Um, I tend to use, for the basic basics, um, when I don't have much space on the camera, is the Rode Video Micro, which is, it's fine. It's not going to give you the best sound. This is, this is just, this is not to replace a lav mic or a wireless. This is purely for B-roll. This is to replace your camera's built-in microphone. And this is, this is, this doesn't have any amplifier preamps in it. So this is going to rely upon your camera having good preamps. So if you, you've got an older Canon, where the, the newer ones are much better, like the R5s, etc. But the older ones were terrible. Like if, for you, something a non-boosted microphone on a 5D Mark II, Mark III, etc. It was awful. You'd have to have the audio level to the max. The sign of a good preamp on your camera is you are able, you set your levels really low on the camera and this. So this is what I like about the Rode um, VideoMic NTG. What's it called? Video mic, video mic Go. Is that it? No. Road NTG. NTG. Go. <laughs> the names. Video mic NTG. That's what it's called. Video uh -huh. mic NTG has what's yes, cool so about it. They did the video it, mic Go and then the video yeah. mic NTG. Yep. It has level on the back here. I don't know if my face is going to stop. The camera's going to. My iPhone will focus on it and or not. I've got some um, uh, photos. There of we it. go. Yeah, here we go. So you can see I can change the levels here, but normally you'd want it to be. Um, yeah, and the other cool thing about it is you can set it to be, which is one of my favorite ways of using it, is to have two different levels. You can see there's um, it's got a light on here, which is it's got two different bars on it. Yeah. So basically, your left channel, your right channel, sorry, is 20 dBs lower than the left channel, which is a great safety feature when you are actually because you'd accidentally have it too loud and. The worst thing about the Sony's, by far, when it comes to audio, there's two of them. For one thing, they still don't have auto levels, which at times can be very useful. For some reason, there's no auto levels. But the worst thing is, is that when you're just using an internal microphone, you've got to have your level quite high, so like 25, 26. But when you put on even a basic video micro, you've got to bring your levels down to about six um, because it's a very hot um, input. What's really nice on some other cameras, like I'm trying to think which actually does, I think it might be Fuji. I think it could be Fuji cameras that have two different levels. I, might, I think it is Fuji. So it has an input level for your internal microphone, and uh, sorry, audio level for your internal microphone and one for your input. So you can have two different things, which is smart as hell, mm. um, and which is great. I mean, it's, it's a very Fuji thing. Um, Fuji have a lot of really clever things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like Panasonic. Panasonic have things like with their manual focusing. They have let you, let you select between linear and focus and by how wire. far the focus throw is and stuff like that. Yeah. You can change All that, that sort of stuff camera. Is, is really clever. But audio is, it's, yeah, be very careful with Sony mics because when you switch, it's happened to me so many times, um, is that you're switching between, you know, the video micro and your internal mic. Because the internal mic's okay, it's better than nothing. Um, but the levels are so drastically different that if you've not adjusted your levels and you don't have auto levels on there, your video mic would be in, unusable if you mm -hmm. ha have it set for your internal mic. Mm -hmm. And if you have your internal mic set for your external mic and then you're not using your external mic, it will be so quiet that it will be barely usable when you bring it up because it's not 32-bit float. One day, maybe. Yeah, but yeah, it'd be interesting I'm, to see a 32-bit float ever gets into cameras, but I guess that's a whole more complex discussion for another day. Um, yeah, I think while we're talking about on-camera microphones, the 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 thing that I come up against with time and time again when people are maybe new to the to the video industry and not, or maybe coming from a stills background and just never really had to deal much with. Um, audio before is that they always gravitate towards these on-camera microphones because it's convenient and because it's easier mm. and mm -hmm. they they the core thing that i i find always helps them understand why it's a bad idea to you just use these all the time is the concept of getting the microphone as close as possible all the time mm. to mm -hmm. the source of your sound and obviously there's loads of situations where you can't do that like you described shooting b-roll where what's happening in front of you is just so quick you can't run over there with a microphone and get mm. one in so you've got to have it on the camera otherwise you'd miss it but mm. normally if you're doing something spoken word you know a piece mm -hmm. of camera an interview or anything like that you can take the time get that microphone off that camera 
get it close to your subject, which is what mm -hmm. lav mics and shotgun mics with boom poles, all of that sort of stuff are so good at. And I, I'm a big lav mic user. I use lav mics all the time for my videos rather than a, than a shotgun. Um, I know lots of people the exact other way around. What, what, where do you normally sit? Do you lav or do you use a shotgun microphone or a mixture? So, so yeah, if I'm doing a proper interview um, for a documentary, then unless I am one man band and I'm filming outside, then it will always be two mics shotgun. If I'm doing a sit down interview indoors, whether it's on my own or with assistant, then it will be two mics from the sound recordist. Then yay, thank God, doesn't mm -hmm. happen much. But always, I'll always have a shotgun and I'll always have a lav mic. Um, so you do both? If I will do both in a sit down situation. Obviously yep. when I'm outside, not gonna happen because I'm not gonna set up a light stand with a boom on it outdoors. Yep. You know, if, and I'm not gonna hold a boom whilst operating a camera because that's silly. Yep. Um, it's possible but it's silly so yeah that's that's why i really recommend the, i mean wireless look when i'm doing an interview sat down indoors i actually generally will use a wired lav oh, really uh i do i still use them i have a sanken cost 11 um which is fantastic and it just goes straight into my xlr um long as I, you know long as i remember to bring it it's it's great um because it's you know, don't worry about batteries or interference and stuff, and it's fantastic. So I know that's great, and I always have them with me when I'm on proper shoots, but what I can't be bothered, which is frequently, is I'll just pull out the wireless, and that's what I will use. And I'll, I'll have a high-quality microphone on there. And also, mm -hmm. when you are looking at microphones, you know, things like the, um, like the smart labs and stuff are designed to be worn outside clothes. Um, and so we won't need much EQing in post, but like the Sanken Cost 11, for example, which is actually what I've got on here, is designed to be under clothes. So you will need to do a bit of EQing in there because it's designed to be a bit more, you know, it's the high end is a bit too high when you are wearing it outside of clothes. So, but yeah, if you're just using the Smart Lab Plus and stuff, it's just basically going to work. Um, but if you are looking at hiding microphones, then you need to get the smallest microphone lav mic you can find and and then look at things like Ryko undercovers and there's other different things you can use. Um, and just listen, get, whenever you hide a microphone and put it the, the best way isn't going to work for me, which is uh, on the skin. Um, because I got hair, um, unless you're willing to shave a little bit. Uh, you know, I, yeah, this is my this is my lav patch that I have here. It's always shaved because <laughs> that's where I put my lav. Um, it's fine for yourself, but not so great when you turn up and do an interview and you with your waxing strips. <laughs> Excuse me, mate. Just take a couple of buttons off before I put the lav on. I just need to give you a little bit of a shave. Um, that's not going to go down super well. So, but that's the best place for it. So, you know, if you're putting it on on women and stuff, generally it's because it's it's you put it on skin. And there's not a lot of rustling on skin. Um, and it also depends on the clothes. Some clothes can be worse than others. Mm -hmm. um, I bought some jackets, which are by far the worst winter jackets for doing audio because they, they make so much noise. Mm -hmm. um, but that just, material you know, that's used quite yeah. often for outside jackets, like puffers and stuff like that, can yeah. be really loud. Uh, I've got really an Adidas loud. one, which is unusable unless I'm completely static. But mm -hmm. cotton and stuff are, are really great. Um, Man-made materials are not so great for hiding. Um, but, you know, it's there's actually a great Facebook group called um, Hiding Labs. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it just shows lots of people sharing advice of how they do it half the time the other half the time they're just um making fun of of other I was, people's i was gonna say there must be a lot spot, of laughing at people with spot exposed their loves. microphone they'll, yeah. be, they'll be pointing at your shot and going spot his microphone uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah but it's worth it these are audio is a great topic but i think we need to probably move on oh uh, yeah I, do, I was just about to try and move us on to lights because we're running out of time a little bit and i do want to discuss lights I, i've saved it to the end yeah. because i do think it is less essential than you know good pair of sticks uh good good mm. audio setup because you can do some absolutely beautiful work now with purely natural light if you know how to do it well yeah. uh, especially nowadays with cameras that are so good with wide dynamic range and with mm. um with amazing low light performance but the the yeah. i can't overstate the importance of lighting and it is something that i see time and time again 
people yeah. who are starting out learn about the camera, they learn about the audio, but they don't learn about light at all. Um, yeah. And so I think it is a really important topic and it's probably one we'll cover in a lot more detail yeah. over time. In my most recent MZ Masterclass one called Filmmaking for Photographers, I've got a whole episode about lighting and there's a massive chunk about natural lighting. Yep. Because lighting, lighting, I'm telling you, it's not just putting up a light. It is seeing what there is and utilizing it. So if you have a window and you have a gray sky and you know you've got daylight for X amount, you know it's going to be a consistent soft light that's going to be there. So you know to use it. But if you see broken clouds and, you can, and it's in the wrong place, you know you're not going to use it. So, you know, same when you're outside, you're positioning your talent with the back to the sun and things like mm -hmm. this and mm -hmm. all these sort of things is, yeah, I don't generally use lights outdoors much at all. The only time is at night, I would have something like a catch light, um, using street lights and stuff for fill and things. I will position myself um, in a, with a street, you know, I'm filming myself out and about. Um, I will position myself, look around and see where I can get best street light, try and find the LED, which is going to give me better colors. But then it's going to be very high, and I know I'm not going to get a catch light. So, what I'll probably do is I'll grab something like, um, where is it? I've got it here somewhere. Here, um, my M Aperture MC. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, sorry, that's, that's, Paula, that's Paula, my cleaner, who's, who's vacuuming, oh. in case you're wondering what that is. I see. Um, <laughs> sorry. Paula, and this is why you, should, bit there. why you should yeah. monitor audio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these are really great. And the other one, I've got them on me, but I've got these, um, they're called L the F Lumis. They're little LED lights you can put on oh, your bracelet. Yes. Yeah. The bracelet ones. And me, yeah. those are great because you know, if you want to be really look like a total D bag, you can have them on your wrist lit up. But the idea is that you can very easily just um, put it on your camera to give you a catch light, you know, because right now I've got a catch light. So I've got a big, I've got a one by one RGB panel from um, Nanlite on there. I've got backlight, mm -hmm. which I can control. Um, both these are remote controls. I love remote controls, but I can control, oh, if it would turn on, there we go. Um, remotely, which is, and change the brightness and color temperature and stuff like that, which is really nice. But um, just being a but you know if i have a really sh strong side light and really stylistic you're not going to get a catch light and so what i would then do is use a small light mm -hmm. on minimum power just by you know clamped on so it's just by the lens just it's like you know they call them ob lights as well um just so it just gives a little bit of a pickup and if, if, if anyone at home is wondering what Phil means there by catch light, um, it, it's that little, you can see them in Phil's eyes there, exactly. Those tiny little highlights in the middle of a pupil, um, it's called a catch light. Uh, and it just helps you look like you've got a bit of life behind your eyes, you know? Yeah. I did a, docu a mini documentary called Portrait of a P uh, Projectionist. It's one of my favorite mm. ones I did set in South Africa. And I used available light. Now, there's a difference between natural light and available light. Natural light is from nature uh available light is what you what is there which can also be nature but you just had this like crappy light bulb thingy uh desk lamp and so i just pointed it at the wall to just bounce off a bit of light and it was a 1dx mark ii so it was pretty no 1d 1dx mark ii it was 1dx original 1dx so it was pretty good mm -hmm. in low light best canon by far at that point so i was shooting quite high in iso 8000 or so but there was no catch light so what I did was I got a um, the fixer who was with me to hold an A4 piece of paper um, behind me. And whilst it wasn't reflecting any light, the white was being picked up, reflected in their light. So you look at that video and you'll see there's a slight white catch light. It's not massive, but it's enough to lift it. And then if you look at another one I did called uh, the seawater drinkers on the same trip, there's no catch light on this interview because it was just me. I was in this guy's bed sit room, which was as big as his bed. He had one light from the ceiling mm -hmm. and that was it. The lighting is terrible. But at that point I was like, okay, it doesn't matter. I need to get the interview and I will, it's not ideal and I will just live with it. But with these days, um, you know, these are so easy. And I've done, if you look at the GH3 launch video I did in 2013 called Genesis, I had a five, 10 ton lighting truck 
um, no, two five ton ones. It was in LA. I didn't need any of that crap. Um, I used a little bit of it. I used them mostly for negative fill and stuff. Um, but there was, we were doing a scene in a taxi where the, the, the female lead and she was in the back of a taxi. And they were trying to come up with these complicated ways of lighting her in the back of the taxi. I went, stop it. Don't need that. And I just pulled out my iPad and slid it um, behind the driver's seat. And there's the glass partition of a taxi. And it was just lit by a, um, I just have this app, which has just got different change of color on white it. White screen, yeah. And it gave me white, whatever it is I need on there. And it just lit her enough to just, and that's all it needed. Mm -hmm. um, just got to make sure you turn off the, um, make sure it stays on. Simple things like that you can have at home that can really help you. And small little really lights you. like these are so good for that. Like this is the Aperture MC, which you just had in the, the Nanlite Pavo tube. You know, th these little lights are, are great for just hiding in your camera bag for whatever situation you might find yourself in. Like yeah. those, those quick um, fire documentaries that you were, you were describing there. Where you're What's really your light quite in the, the time. background? You got any lights like these? Ben? You should get some yeah. of these. Have you thought about getting that's, some of these? That's what that is, <laughs> the seven C. Be so. It would have helped if I'd actually charged this up, but this is does have a battery in it. These I have um, in my lounge. I have this weird chandelier type thing. Half of them there's like eight lights on it. Half of them are Philips Hue bulbs, and the other half so that's four, um, four in each. And I've got four of these. It's, maybe it's ten, five of each. And what I they're quite the Philips Hue are fine at a hundred percent um for no if you're just normally living your life and not mm -hmm. thinking about filming like i am the whole time just having philips hue bulbs are fine but as soon as you start filming with philips hue bulbs unless they're at a hundred percent they are going to they're going to give you especially on sony cameras strobing uh video cameras you can actually get rid of it most of the time but the so i've put five of these up in there and Whilst they don't work over things like uh, Alexa and stuff like that, there's a Bluetooth app called uh, Sidious Pro. I think it is. Dar I call yep. it Sidious. I always Sidious. call it Sidious. Sidious Link. Dark Sidious. Link. Dar yeah. Sidious. Exactly. Um, I can't. Yeah. But <laughs> these, um, <laughs> they're not super, <laughs> super bright, but these are RGB. Are they WWs? I think um, so. Yes, RGB. I think they are. I think they're, yeah, they they're, they're the full. Same as the E. So they're going to give you beautiful um, daylight, beautiful tungsten, and also any color you want and effects. So I've used them for effects. I've used them for like fires and stuff like that. I use them for fill. And I also use them uh, for white, for brightness for whites to when I need to be really focused because of that daylight. Like these are fantastic. I've been waiting for these sort of bulbs to come out for years. And now I would put them in every fixture of my, my house, but because they're not Wi-Fi, um, now Bluetooth, it's much more of a pain to remotely control them. Whereas every sure. other light bulb in my house is all, smart connected um so but these i just found these and I've, I've actually lit myself with just one of these if you look at my video uh best camera gear the two videos i did at the end of the year they were both lit with just one of these on me and the background was um fire um it was five of those Interesting. and if you're going to use like your computer and stuff as a light then make sure you don't have a going dark mm -hmm. but um that's the thing about lighting. There's so many things you can use in addition to having lights. But the key thing about the reason why you want proper lights, like, you know, whether it's an aperture 120 with a softbox and stuff, it's all about continuous, constant light that you have full control over. And the reason why you want a nice big source is you want to do, an, you know, it's nice and more, much more flattering. I mean, this isn't that big a source, but it's still soft enough. It's still giving me not that nasty. It's OK. Um, and then on, on the backlight, I tend to have a, a harder source, tends to be. So yeah, so a few a I few like. concepts there which I want to break down for people watching in case they're because I'm just aware that a lot of people who are quite new to the industry might be watching this. So um, the the general rule is the larger your source of light, the softer your source of light is, and the smaller your light source of light is, the harder it will be, and the softer yeah. your light, the more flattering it will be. So think I'm of a big here. window yeah big window is yeah. a perfect example thank mm -hmm. you um so a big window right next and you position your talent right in front of it and it's behind the camera will provide a lovely soft flat even wash of light across whatever you're filming um and so buying if, if you're just starting out and you want to shoot with only your lights and you only buy tiny lights like this you are going to struggle with that sort of thing 
because they're very small and they don't have that much punch to them, you know, that that much brightness. So the way to make a small light like that bigger is to shine it through a diffusion or bounce it off something because then whatever you're shining it through yeah. or bouncing off becomes the source not the actual light itself bouncing is a great thing for people to to use and it just you know i've got some more expensive systems but a reflector a cheap reflector Absolutely. you can buy off amazon bounce it Simple, off of that five and to one yeah you just can you can have a hard light on that and you will get a really lovely soft light um so i can't recommend bouncing enough it's and not not people do it people they look on youtube and they see everybody with the massive soft boxes and go i must get a massive soft box problem with massive soft boxes are they are massive and i can't actually put my massive soft box up in my lounge because my ceiling's not high enough um, yeah <laughs> so yeah it's i actually now so i bounce in my lounge and it works great yeah yeah one of these and you can you can either have it as the the pure white bounce thing which you can bounce something off or often the the middle of them is translucent so you can shine something through it if you've got enough brightness as well yeah um which often works well um so yeah that's absolutely um a way you can go and if you if you want that some good lights to choose are um little fixtures like these um amaran lights from aperture are very av quite affordable options which will give you a lot of light like a huge amount of light uh there's the little like nan lights um smallest forza ones like the forza 60 things like that that's what i yeah if you look at my review uh, which one is it if you look at the the one i did recently on the axon transmitter Yep. That is lit with a Forza 60 bounced. Yes, they're brilliant so, for that. And they also yeah. have a really nice little softbox if you want to um, mm -hmm. if you want to use that. So here we go. Here's the little Nanlite Forza. But I could, yeah, I could, I couldn't get a, uh, you yeah, know, I used it with the Fresnel bounced. And because I could, you know, even with a bigger softbox, I couldn't get a softer light source as I actually got with my bounce. Sure. So. Yeah, sure. Um the other thing I quite like are these um, tiny little panels from, from Lupo mm. um, because they've got a narrower beam angle and they're a bit more thirsty on the battery. Um, these go really bright um, for the size of panel that they are. Um, you know, they're really quite punchy. Um, so for something small to travel with, to bounce, that's an option. The other thing that I talk about a lot with new customers is flexible panels, which is actually what normally lights me in this setup here. Um, because these are something you don't have to bounce, you don't have to shine through diffusion. They can go really small to travel with them because they're flexible. And then they mm -hmm. unload to be a nice big panel, um, which you can just shine directly at people. And it's a reasonable size and reasonably soft which yeah. can be quite nice middle ground option yeah yeah there's a lot of things you can do if you've got some bait if you know if you only got some hard lights loads of things you can use you know to diffuse things and to bounce things you know even just bouncing off of a ceiling to give you you know to fill up the yeah. room with um so, you know when it's dark um so it's you know my house is very dark um apart from at certain times of the, the year at certain times of the day and it depends on what our weather's like and whilst those are great those happen they're not very good for continuous light because it doesn't last for very long mm. you know when it comes through my breakfast room i might get an hour an hour and a half of good light great light but it's, it's obviously changing and the shadows are changing and of course if a cloud goes over or that's it then it's like my light is screwed so i do tend to do most of my filming of myself um after dark so i have full control over my light and i you can yeah. replicate easily replicate um daylight you can easily replicate things like golden hour so after, uh, I, i've used uh, aperture 300 um d with um i haven't got the switch one with lots of uh, double cto mm -hmm. and shining it through something to create like a, a like a it's coming through you know uh, like a line of a window or something sure and i can get golden hour in the background and it looks beautiful and i know that it's better than real golden hour because it's going to stay mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's going to be consistent and so think of your light using your lights in a creative way lights aren't just for using on the subject that you're 
which is me for the background that's why i put things like candles and stuff just because it accents a little bit like that um i like to have a little bit unless you want complete darkness you know like black and stuff but yeah i mean it's um i'm a big fan of working with what's there and um and i do like using domestic lights and that's why i've liked the aperture one so much because you can just take these with you on shoots and you can get the one of the uh, the the other t is it E42 whatever the the bayonet that's an E, E27 um, E27 is the what's the bayonet, uh, what's the bayonet, bayonet is E47 yeah, yeah so you, uh, but you can get those adapters so you could use these you know go to people and say do you mind if I just switch out the light bulbs and you can use these and these these will give you such flexibility um for filling up or just adding a little mm -hmm. accent mm -hmm. lights and because i've got a built-in battery it doesn't last that long it's like an hour i think um you can in theory use them away from a light fixture but i really that's an emergency um the battery just doesn't last long enough that's when these are great because unlike a lot of little led panels and uh, little lights like this is when you're low on battery and you plug it into usb this stays at full power whereas a lot of these little ones will drop to like 60 70 percent maximum brightness when you're plugging in via usb so these will keep these are great um and yeah they, they, they've they got all the effects in there you're never going to use them the only one you might use will be the fire it's the only one i ever well, use TV. i've never used TV, i sometimes you know? use tv for sort of close-ups of people watching tv you know, I did a music video where people were watching TV in one scene and I was I just couldn't figure out this was before all of these lights, what I could possibly do to make it look like they're watching TV. And then I realized they were watching TV. And <laughs> so what I did was I recorded a long piece of TV recording and with all the adverts and then played it back on the TV or whatever it was, or Sky Plus at three times speed. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a really nice flicker because the flicker you get from normal tv isn't going to be enough because it you know you could be on the same shot with the same light for ages i wanted it to be constantly changing and it worked brilliantly mm -hmm. so yeah sometimes the obvious is the one you want to use use the Maybe actual thing that's creating the light <laughs> yes um vertigo video productions just put light panels astro one by one soft here which he says is a stunner um what mm. i love about normal one by one panels like that and we haven't actually mentioned those in this lighting discussion so far at all despite them being probably the most common style of light over the last five years in led terms um what they're great for is speed they're, they're difficult to travel with because they don't break down hmm. at all they just are the size that they are but you whack them on a light stand with a battery on the back turn it on you're done you know yeah. the speed of them and the speed to then move you know, say you're doing 10 interviews around different parts of a building, just being able to pick it up, move it to there, pick it up, move it to there, pick it up to move it to there, super quick and easy. So they are great for those. What they're not great for is fiddling about with your lights. You know, sometimes you want that speed and you just don't want to fiddle with anything. Um, sometimes you do. Sometimes you want to craft and shape a little bit and, and spend a bit more time tweaking things. And LED one by ones are quite hard to tweak because they by nature you stick a battery on the back turn it on and it chucks light in front of it in 120 degree beam angle so um they are great i wouldn't normally recommend them and oh actually if you're only going to buy one light and that's the only thing you're going to buy when you're just starting off i think i would lean towards maybe a flexible one or just one of those because then you can use it like a portable window and just carry it around with you. And if you have got nothing to light the front of your subject, light them with that. But you can crucially move it away from your camera a little bit to get a bit of depth and movement. What would you say, Phil? Would you agree with that? Oh, you've got we've got no audio for some reason, I think, Phil. Don't know why. That's strange. <laughs> Watch him frantically. <laughs> He's figuring it out why. Um, but yeah, that would be my... Um, and Loom is saying any recommendations for a lighting set, preferably Fresnel's, not panels. Um, yes, absolutely. For Fresnel's, we find mu it's much more common nowadays 
to use something like the aperture here that's next to me, something which is a chip on board light like that. Oh, I think that's your audio comeback, Phil. I can hear a rustle. No, don't, tr don't trust that one. Oh, that's a laptop, is it? Right, so that I've had to switch over to a top mic. Um, ah. That was fresh batteries in my transmitter on my UWPD, and, and I guess they, they weren't that fresh. But now I'm just on a top mic, so it's not as good. This is the BP1M. But I'm actually just going to put on the noise cancellation because it will get rid of some of that um, noise cancellation. So I was just saying, so, Fresnel lights yeah. themselves have gone out of fashion a little bit, the ones with the Fresnels built yeah. in. So quite often yeah. people are using chip on board lights like that with Fresnels on them. So if you if you like working with Fresnels, Loom, and you want um, a lighting set of those, look at the little Nanolite 4s or 60s that we talked about, or the apertures, that sort of style of light would be my advice. But sorry, I was asking you whether you agreed with the one by one comment. Yeah, I've got a one by one. I mean, I'm on a one by one here. I've got a really mm. good one by one here, which is the Roto Light uh, X1, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. amazing, which is basically the best one I've ever used, which I'm doing a video on. Um, but yeah, I mean, one by one LED panels are a great way of having as a, as a first light, I really do think, because they're very flexible. Uh, my advice would always be uh, for a three point kit, would be a soft panel. And a couple of hard sources of, you know, like the old dado lights we, we would use. So equivalents of something like that. So, that, but most likely I would very rarely use three. Mm -hmm. I mostly just use two lights mm -hmm. as, as, as it depends on the situation. I will sometimes use one, but I'm, if I'm not, if I'm finding that I'm not getting enough separation from the background, I will either use a second light to light the background or I will use it. This is quite strong, not something I would normally do. because I like my light to be more motivated. But it's not real, so it's fine. Um, but as other people, you know, I'm just moving off, like just very, just seeing all the other questions before we go. I just wanted to say that, you know, things like follow focuses, you know, yeah. not essentials, and I never use them. But, you know, if, uh, if you're having issues with certain lenses, don't have a long enough travel or things like that, then fine. Just if you're using a lot of stills lenses, you've got to be very careful, of course, because you've got things like um, focus by wire and stuff not really going to work very well. But um, the really the only other thing we've really not talked about, which I think is essential, is actually filters. Um, well, we've just had a comment actually from B Ford saying matte box, ND filters, things like that. Yeah, I don't use matte boxes because I'm always changing lenses. Um, I use ND filters obviously all the time on cameras without NDs built in, uh, which is the mirrorless cameras essentially, and cinema cameras and things like that. So these, these are just, I've got loads of ones, I've got some really expensive ones. Um, these are the Freewell ones. Freewell ones are really quite nice to do. Just be careful when you're buying at variable NDs. Don't be too cheap and don't buy ones which have an entire range of uh, all, you know, everything from one to 10 stops because it's not going to mm -hmm. be good. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up with a massive color shift between them anyway, which you're always going to get with, that's a downside with variable NDs. They're always going to be color shift no matter what you do. The only ones mm -hmm. that don't are like fixed. Um, split up into two, so they do a two to five, six to nine, thing. and it's the same as uh, Polar Pro ones, which are also very good. Uh, they're just more expensive, so I really like these. Get the my best advice is get the biggest size you can get for your lenses, which is here is 82. And actually, I really, you know, this is the variable step up ring from uh, HMI, the Revo ring. Yep. So this is 60 for any lens from a 67 to 82. This will go on. Otherwise, use step rings and but if you are using step rings try and get them to be um in big increments don't add lots and lots and lots and lots of them and like for example here this is what i do with my 35 1.8 is i have um just one step up on it uh, mm -hmm. you can see that if it's focusing on it and this lives on it so even though it does mean i have to have a bigger lens cap and it's a bit you know i doesn't matter because i know that i'm always going to have an 82 mil on here and that's all i really care about not so last the worst thing you could possibly have on the shoot well there's lots of worse things but when it comes to filters is you haven't got the right step up ring and it won't go in front of your lens you're like no i mean i did a shoot not that long ago it was for, it was for a video i was making for youtube and i brought the wrong filter with me um and it was i ended up having mm -hmm. to shoot with shutter speed and i'm like oh god I don't think you can tell because most there was not any sort of like close shots of people walking past and stuff and I haven't got away with it. I did have a, a diffusion so I, you can get these mist ones, lots of 
variable NDs with diffusion in, they're fine. Just remember that if you're going to buy variable NDs with diffusion in, they are not going to look good on long lenses. So they're going to be soft. They're going to, diffusion filters, I use a lot of them. I've been talking about them a lot. I've got one on right now. They're not for long lenses because you are going to end up zooming in on the all of these bits on there which are designed to diffract the light and stuff and it's going to just soften things like crazy sure, it so, effect- effectively dials up the amount of diffusion as you zoom in yeah so you, you i mean i literally could not get acceptable focus and also it does mm-hmm. weird things to focus but it was the fact that i couldn't get accept on a 7200 i could not get focus um mm-hmm. so i had to take them off as i didn't bring the standard ones i just bought the wrong ones so just i like having nds and then i like having diffusion filters which I can put on and take off as and when I need them. And I'm a, I've become a big fan of the huge filters recently, much more. Um, just something like an eighth or a quarter um, Pro Mist, just for highlights and stuff. And it just, I don't want anything that looks like, oh, look at that diffusion filter. I just use nice and subtle, and it just makes things just look just a bit more pleasing, really. Mm-hmm. Especially when you have those days when things are, the clouds are, um, uh, broken and you know, really harsh whites, and especially on certain cameras where your your diffusion uh, is really your so your your fall off on highlights is terrible, um, and that's why I made my own for the, the DJI Air 2S. Uh, I made my own, and now my roll off on highlights is so much better. And, and now Freewell have made some for me and sent them to me, so I'll see what they're Amazing. like. So, yeah, so taking one... things into your own hands. One question I want to just get in there before we wrap up and then let's wrap up after this, shall we? Um, Lunation Lab has put an interesting little question here saying, hi, uh, any unexpected gear to recommend for getting started shooting in travel slash adventure content like you did with mm. the Wonder List? He's working off a FX6. Um, so he said unexpected gear. So I guess he's thinking of any wild card things which he might have forgotten about. Um, mm. But I think it'd be nice to just mention what the essentials, since this is about the essential kit for that sort of, yeah. you know, travel work. What would you say your go-to essentials would be? I mean, when I was shooting the Wonderlist, what was really key for me was having a proper main video camera, which would be for all the 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 solid work, the audio recording, and then, you know, the interviews and stuff and all the main B-roll, but also having a second camera, which was my A7S at the time, uh, or A7S II it became when that came out, and having that with me the whole time. So if I needed to be reactive and do some handheld quickly, or to just even when we're going out and about and we haven't got the main camera with you, you want to lug it around, I've always got the camera on me, or in the car, and I see something when we're driving along, and the you know the F- FS7 was in the back. I'm like I'm not going to get out, but I see a great shot. We're about to drive past. Pull it out with the, you know the A7S to whatever it was, and get it. This was literally the most important extra piece of gear I had was having that small second camera. I mean, obviously now we have iPhones and other phones which are good, uh, but it's still going to be harder to cut in with, um, especially with the, one of the biggest giveaways is always going to be your ND when you're using an iPhone and things like that uh, for your extra angles quickly. Whereas as long as you've got your, you know, variable ND with you and a still camera type thing, I call them stills cameras, but they're, you know, A7S III is just about my favorite camera. Um, and I always got it with me. I always know I can get really high quality video. And and yeah, I would, I could never imagine having, going out with just an FX6 on, on a documentary shoot. Even if I didn't need a second angle, I would have it just in case that was always my and the amount of stuff that you see in that series where these little moments which i would have missed you know it's so easy to these these cameras turn on straight away and then you record and you don't miss things and when you're shooting documentaries that's what it's about it's about being able to record quickly you don't shoot a documentary with a red komodo that takes a minute to start up um always a shot there hang on hang on Wait, don't come any closer. Someone hold the monkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 stay over there. Stay over there. And it's like, you can't. Now um, do it again like, naturally. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. It's, no, it's not on the right. Oh, hang on. Oh, no. You need a camera that can work really fast. And, you know, with FX6 and everything, really fast. But, um, yeah, I think that's probably my best advice. 
And I would say these days, you know, if I were shooting it now, um, a pocket recorder type thing, mm. that I'd always have on me. So if I needed really high quality audio, you know, we, we meet somebody who's got a great story to tell. So that takes no space up in your bag. And I just yeah. plonk it on them and grab it. So it's about getting the quality really quickly and you know, just have a sling bag on you with these little bits in it. And I, that's what I always did and I always do on Would shoots. Would you take a sling bag with extras? Little lights like this sort of yeah. thing mm -hmm. around yep. just to get out of jail car. Yeah, pre yep. I always even, even back then I, they had, I had little LED panels which I always took mm -hmm. with me. Um, because I actually didn't take big lights with me on those shoots. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. Ha we were mostly filming outdoors. Well, it was nearly all like. natural light, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, occasionally we were indoors, but I think yeah, the only episode I did take lights on was the only episode I drove to, which was at Amsterdam, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because and I did use them, um, but it was like the rest of the time it's just not going to happen. And sure. obviously with flexi, flexi panels and stuff like that would be really nice, but all our interviews were, were three cameras, <laughs> so. Um, lighting for three cameras is hell anyway. So you, you just simply got to make them, you got to find locations with great available light yep. and work with it. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's a great place to wrap up. So some really interesting stuff there. Thank you for that. Um, oh, somebody's we... saying Hans oh. Dorland. There we go. Hans, look at my video on the transmitters, the Axion transmitter I did recently. And also my recent video on One Man Five Cats channel, YouTube channel, both lit with the light bridge, uh, CRS, they call it, what are they call it? CR, sorry, he calls it CRLS 2.0. Yeah, that's right, the re reflection panel. So I have the grab bag, which has got um, the two main strengths of the one by ones. And I have the, the meat, I have three, there's three of them. I don't use the really strong one, which is basically a mirror, but I do have the medium one up in my lounge. And that's what I use to bounce using that 60 watt um, NAN light. And there is a much softer one uh, which is amazing. When you bounce off of that, it's like a big window, way mm. bigger than the actual one by one. The trouble is you need a big, strong light. A 360 will do nothing on it. So you need like a 300 on that. Yeah. Or one of these. So... If you're going to do that on a budget, these little Amaran ones would be... A... Yeah. What, I mean, what's that only... brightness? So it's the Aperture. It's the Aperture Amarans. Um, they're... So Aperture yeah. 200 Ds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could use those, and you could also use the, um, you know, you want to, like, try and, uh, for now, will obviously be good, because it will focus that light onto that panel better. Yeah. But you could use those, what do you call those, like, things you put on the front to intensify the light? I can't remember what they're bloody called. Um, they're okay. Projection do lenses and stuff. Project or, or do you, you just it. mean the reflectors? The reflector thingy, yeah. Yeah, um, and so the domes. They, they, mm. The domes, they, they're obviously going to increase your light strength a lot. Um, it's just you want a bit more control. You do generally want a bit more control when you're using something like the light bridges and stuff like that, um, because you you want to focus your light onto just yeah. You want it that. to hit just that panel and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Not very like cool. Bouncing everywhere. So cool. Yeah, they're very good. I, I will do a video again on them at some point. No, that would be a good one. That'd be a good one to do. One day. One day. Right, so we're going to be doing lots more of these streams. We're going to try and do these much more regularly, aren't we, Phil? Um, but um, mm. thank you all very, very much for joining us. Um, I think it's quite a, it's a good discussion. To, it'd be nice one to do again in a little bit more detail on each area, maybe maybe showing some examples or something like that. Um, yeah, would be other than tripods, good. I think we can probably do much. Definitely, Tri audio tripods get and... quite simple quite quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> audio and and lights obviously could do multiple lights Absolutely. on but um i think just if we you know we could easily do something about audio about radio mics about body packs just on those and yeah. just talk about protocols on that whereas lights that is literally the most endless topic you could possibly talk about wow i'm up for it <laughs> I, I love talking about lights absolutely right okay thank you all very much for joining me and thank you so much for your time philip welcome um, take care. Cool. Okay. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you very soon. Bye.
The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers.